like to welcome everyone here tonight. And as we sing, let's all sing out. Some glad morning when this life is over, I fly away, fly away to a home on God's special shore. Thank you. 
42, 42, Beulah Land. Those who wish may stand and we'll sing this song and after that we'll have our opening prayer with Brother Terry. <clears throat> I've reached the land of love divine, and all its riches freely mine. Here shines a dim one blissful day, for all my night has passed away. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea, where mansions are prepared for me. And in the shining glory shore, I am my home forevermore. My Savior comes and walks with me, and sweet communion here at we. He gently leads me by his hand, for this is heaven's borderland. Oh, you love land, sweet you love land. Number 12, number 12, Amazing Grace.
It's hard to tell good news without having a smile on your face. It's hard to tell good news and not be excited about it. And we should be excited. We should be happy. This news in particular is one that not only provides momentary happiness with the emotion that it brings, but it provides logical happiness as well. We have a problem. We have a problem in that our sin separates us from God. And because our sin separates us from God, we can't be with Him. Why is that? Because everyone sins and falls short of the glory of God. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone is unrighteous. Because of that fact, we're separated from God. We have no chance to be with Him. There is, however, good news. The good news is that a sacrifice has been made for us that allows us to be with Him. That takes that gap created by sin and gets rid of it. That takes that problem and eliminates it. That's why the gospel is good news. But more on this idea. How can someone dying on a cross be talked about in happiness? After all, this is something that was not smiled upon. It was meant to be shameful. It was meant to cause sorrow. In fact, the Romans did it in such a public way so as to be a warning to anyone else to not defy them like these individuals had. Crucifixion was horrendous. It was cruel and unusual punishment in every sense of the word. And it was meant to be such. What interests me is not only that, that this particular form of punishment was used to show God's love for us and to redeem us, but even more so that this particular form of punishment is quite possibly the worst that has ever been in the history of the world. It interests me to consider that at the perfect time Jesus came, and yet the time that he came was the most cruel and evil punishment around. That at the perfect time Jesus came and died, and it was the most humiliating. We're going to look a little bit at that humiliation and at that pain tonight. This morning we discussed in detail the picture in Gethsemane, the garden where Jesus was betrayed, and we looked at betrayal. Well, this evening, we're going to be looking at how Jesus suffered. If you will, turn your Bibles over to John chapter 19. And we're going to be looking at verses 16 through 27 for this evening's lesson. Verses 16 through 27. If you do not have a Bible with you this evening, there should be one in the pew around you somewhere. Uh, we have them dispersed pretty evenly throughout and if you will, follow along with me in that reading, please. John chapter 19, beginning with verse 16. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the soul, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lot for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Thank you for following along in that reading with me. 
This evening, in our study of Jesus' suffering, I'm wanting us to divide up that time into three main points, three main topics. First, the walk to Golgotha. Second, the king on the cross. And third, the king's last request. I want to divide it up that way because that, those are the big picture uh, topics that I'm wanting us to focus on. First, this idea of the walk to Golgotha. It may be necessary to explain something. Golgotha does mean place of the skull, skull. Calvary is a Latin word meaning skull. And when the Catholic Church was very uh, high in power, the Latin Vulgate was the translation that was used. It was seen as the holy language, and the layperson could not read it. They gave the, the priests and the church quite an advantage over the layperson because they could say uh, whatever meant whatever they would like. Uh, but for that reason, the word Calvary has become so commonly associated with it. Uh, that comes from the Latin that is transliterated there. The Greek transliterated is Golgotha. So that's why there is a, a difference there in some translations. But the walk to Golgotha, the walk to the place of the skull, can you imagine? Let's remember what all Jesus has gone through. Apart from what we discussed this morning with the betrayal that he had to endure in the garden, he's been through trials where he was beaten, spit upon, and humiliated. He's been through punishment by Roman soldiers. He was whipped, beaten, his flesh torn. Many people died from that beating at the hands of Roman soldiers. They stopped it here just short of that, hoping that that would satisfy the crowd. The mob that had gathered and was asking for his life. And then after that, he had to bear his cross to the place of the skull. Now, this was the common practice. That was part of the humiliation, was for them to, the person being crucified to have to walk through the streets of the city bearing that cross, and often someone else walked in front of them with a sign showing what they had done. Sometimes it was hung on a rope around their neck. This was humiliating. This was seen as something that was to be frowned upon highly. We may have discussed before that crucifixion was so horrendous of a punishment that it was only legally done to non-Romans. You couldn't crucify a Roman. It was against the law. They wouldn't do that to one of their own because of how humiliating and horrendous of a punishment it truly is. This was reserved for insurrectionists. People who would rise up against Rome. People who would cause problems. People who were pretty bad. And it was meant to be an example to others to step in line and not to get out of place. It's interesting that during this time when he is carrying his own cross to the place of the skull, the place where he would be crucified, a, a small way from the city, not very far, it's interesting the shadows that are fulfilled here. Rem remember back with me to Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, we have the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham, or at least the commanding of that from God, and Abraham carrying out everything up to the deed itself. Just to refresh our memory, let's turn over to Genesis chapter 22. We'll just look at the first six verses there. Genesis chapter 22. Beginning verse 1 reads, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, sat on his donkey, and took his two young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with your donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took his hand and fired in the knife. So he went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. He answered, Behold the fire 
require the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place in which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached down his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And then Abraham finds the ram with his horns caught in the thicket and offers it in place of his son. Rabbis loved this story. They were very fond of the principle that it taught here. And this was a shadow of Jesus himself. Isaac packed the wood for his own sacrifice. He carried the firewood that would be his own death. We're told by the Hebrew writer a little bit of insight to Abraham's mind. Abraham knew that God had promised that through this particular son I would make your seed bless all the world. So he assumed that after sacrificing his son, God would raise him from the dead. So Abraham had every intention sacrificing his son. And Isaac had to carry that wood himself. Can you imagine that lonely trip up the mountain? Isaac seemed to get the picture. He looked at the wood, looked at his father, looked at the torch. So we got the wood, we got the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And then as his father binds him and lays him on the altar that he built, you might imagine once again him saying, Dad, where's the sacrifice at? What are you doing? Jesus carried his own cross. I love the song 10,000 Angels because it paints a picture of this for me. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have been set free by them. He could have had the entire world destroyed. But he didn't. He died for you and me. They ridiculed him. They spat upon him. They taunted him. And he sat there and died. He let it happen. This isn't the only illustration and, and prophecy that here that is fulfilled, shadow that is fulfilled. Um, another shadow that is fulfilled out of the Old Testament in this is the idea of the scapegoat. We're familiar with the scapegoat terminology and the thought behind it. You may not realize that that kind of idea was in the Bible and originated in the law there. Every year, the sacrifice of the sin offering would be in the form of a scapegoat that would be taken outside the camp and put out into the wilderness. Furthermore, even so, the sacrifice that was made for the sins of the people had to be done outside the camp. It was not inside the camp. It was outside the camp. So you have that dual idea there. Where did Jesus go to be sacrificed? He carried his cross outside the camp, outside the city, outside the dwelling graves of Israel to die there. You can find that idea being applied to this specific thing in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 11 and 13. There. It's interesting to me. That with all of this going on, the little things line up. But with God, of course they do. We, we should expect it to be so. But there's this overwhelming that this was a plan. It wasn't a last minute failure from God. This was the idea all along. Jesus knew what he was walking into. Jesus fully understood every step of the way what would be happening next. The next idea here that is really interesting to me about this walk to Golgotha is that John presents a, a different focus than the other gospel writers. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are often called the synoptic gospels because they bear a lot of similarities, because they seem to give the same aspects of uh, Jesus' life. Whereas me and two others might be witnessing the same event, 
I, if we all recorded, I would write down different things and different details that I would notice that others may not leave, that they leave out and include different ones. It doesn't mean that any of our accounts are wrong or right. It simply just means that different perspectives and different emphasis. For example, Matthew was a Jew, and he wrote in a Jewish way. His Hebrew mannerisms show his importance not on the specific details, but they're okay with some of the details being glossed over if you get the big picture, you get the big idea. You can also see that same example in Luke with who he's writing to and from his background. You often see words that are used that are specific to doctrine, a physician's word. It's interesting to me that John presents this the way he does. You have no mention of Simon of Cyrene in John's account. That's not in any way to diminish Simon helping him. In fact, if anything, it gives us a little bit more insight that there was a point in which Jesus was carrying his cross alone before he was unable to do so anymore. But what was John trying to emphasize? That Jesus went to the cross. That Jesus carried his cross. That Jesus allowed himself to be taken. That Jesus stood by when they yelled all these harsh accusations at him that were wrong, false accusations. But Jesus let them crucify him. This idea of the Via Dolorosa, which is the uh, traditional way of sorrows path that is taken by Jesus whenever he's going out to the place of the skull, his trip carrying the cross isn't what John emphasizes. You don't get the scene of the screaming crowds and the crying crowds as he walks by that you see in Luke chapter 23. And Luke 23 verses 28 and 31 gives a more vivid description of Christ and his walk to Golgotha. It shows the crying crowds. It shows more details. John is trying to stress the point that Jesus was in control. This is something that Jesus did. John's entire gospel is written for one unique purpose. So that there can be a reason to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He records different miracles for the purpose of showing that Jesus was the Son of God. He even outlines his purpose statement in his gospel. In case anybody ever wondered, John, why did you write this? What was your purpose for writing this book? He tells you out in plain English. He doesn't want it to be left to any uh, interpretation as to what he was trying to do. He wanted everyone to know. This was the purpose. It interests me to see how that plays out in his gospel account. Whenever he finally makes it to Golgotha, when he finally comes upon this place of the skull, um, a place that I might should mention that while you may see uh, modern day pictures of this is where it is, and this we know the exact spot, there is no historical accuracy that we can know for 100% certain. Um, you may have seen the pictures and the maps that show a specific place, and it does have quite a resemblance to a skull. It's very possible that be the place, uh, but we have no assurance that that is the specific idea. We do know that it is very close to the city, that it is not far from the gate of the city at all, and that there was some reason it was called the place of the skull. Perhaps of other crucifixions that had gone on before that, perhaps just due to the rock formations that were there. Um, for whatever reason, this was not a nice place. It was not a place that was favored. And the Romans, as, said, as we mentioned before, they wanted everyone to see this. They wanted everyone to know what was going on. They didn't want it to be hidden away somewhere. The purpose of a crucifixion was to, number one, cause ultimate pain and suffering, and number two, to send a message to everyone else. Not to mess with us. You do what we say or you'll get this. They were famous for having mass crucifixions. When he comes to the cross, 
The crossbar that he is no doubt unpacking is put on the rest of the cross, which was usually already there and already in the ground. Um, in some of the theatrical movies, you may see him packing the entire cross and or being lowered or raised up and put into the hole and dropped in. Um, that, that was not the uh, way that the majority of other crucifixions were done. It doesn't mean it's impossible. It was just from every historical account we have on that that's the way it was taking place. But as he was put up, next, not far off the ground at all, next to these two thieves in between them, we have the best and the worst time since the Garden of Eden. The best time because it's a time of redemption. A time of sacrifice. Of a man giving his life for others. The worst because it's our God dying. It's our Messiah, our Savior being betrayed. And every, everybody scowling at him. Everyone disrespecting him. An inscription was wrote and written by Pilate and placed upon the cross. And he wrote it in Greek and Latin and Aramaic. Aramaic being the language of the people of that era, being the most common language. Greek being the language that was used in commerce as an international language that everyone knew. And Latin being the primary language of Rome itself wanted everybody to know that this was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now you may remember from our reading that the chief priests and the scribes weren't very happy about that. They wanted him, they wanted Pilate to have it put, he said he's the King of the Jews. They didn't want somebody to think that their king was on the cross, that their Messiah had lost. Pilate finally seems to stand up to them a little bit where he seemed to get bullied before and said, I've written what I've written. Yet this inscription is there for everyone to see the king of the Jews being humiliated. His clothing is being divided amongst the four soldiers, which was the number, uh, half the number of a group of soldiers that stayed in one tent together. You have eight usually per tent. And four was given to this detail for him to be crucified. And they're dividing his clothing. And then they come to his undergarment. Which, in accordance with the law, you can look at Leviticus 19.19, 19, um, was supposed to be made of one fabric. It was not supposed to be a mix of two. Uh, when Moses is preaching on this and delivering this to the people, Deuteronomy 22.11, uh, he shows what the spirit and purpose of this is supposed to be, why it was supposed to be this way. It had to do with the mixing of two different types of cloth. Um, it had to do uh, specifics, not with primarily the hygiene as much as just it was a symbol. Yet, here is this single, seamless undergarment. They weren't that hard to make. This is nothing super special that Jesus had that no one else had. It would be very simple for someone else to make. It has no seam. It can't be divided four ways. So they cast lot for it. This didn't just fulfill a prophecy. It was shameful. It was part of the shame for him to have to die without clothing. That's part of the shame that our Lord endured. This wasn't just a man from Nazareth. This wasn't just a great teacher. The Son of God. This was our Redeemer, our Savior. This was our hope. Someone laying down his life for us. I have a lot of good friends. I have a lot of people that I hold very dear to my heart. But I can honestly say I only know of one who left a throne in heaven to come down and die the most horrible death, the most shameful death, humiliating death that has ever been so that I could be with them even though I disrespect them, even though I disobey them. That's my Jesus. That's who suffered. That's who next week we're going to look more at him 
having died on the cross. That's the Jesus that we're going to see rise again. There was a last request that he made. As John, the, the beloved apostle, the apostle whom he loved, was standing there with his mother, he uses some language that were common um, in legal adoptions. He was telling his disciple whom he loved, John, to take care of his mother, and also for his mother to take care of his son. It's likely that at this point that she is, Mary is in her early 50s, and it's likely that um, she is widowed. Jesus was the oldest son. His brothers didn't believe in him. It wouldn't be until after his resurrection that any of them would seem to hold him in any honor at all. He had a responsibility take care of his mother. In Exodus 20 and 12 and Deuteronomy 5, 16, we're told clearly under the law you're supposed to honor your father and mother. And that carries with it not just respect, but that word honor involves taking care of, making sure their needs are provided for. That was his last request. That was what he wanted from John. Before he died on that cross, that was one of the things that came to his mind. You can do an entire study just on the things that Jesus said from the cross. It's amazing. We don't have a lot of recorded words from him, but the ones that we do are powerful. And he did. It means a lot to me that while Jesus suffered for me, that he was thinking of others. That he was asking for the other's forgiveness because they don't know what they do. That he was making sure his mother would be taken care of in this hard time for her. She's having to see her innocent son crucified, humiliated, bringing shame to her whole family in the eyes of all people. I want to ask you a question. Jesus suffered for you. He died for you. In a way that we can't even describe with words. There is no words that I can use to impress upon each and every one of us how horrible of suffering that Jesus went through. My question for you is, what will you do for him? Or perhaps it would be better asked, what will you not do for him? What is it that you're not willing to give up? What is it you're not willing to suffer? What thing in there is there in your life that is so important that you can't make a response to Jesus because of it. That you can't give your life over to Him because of it. Consider that while we offer an invitation in a moment. And give you a chance to respond to Jesus' grace, His mercy, His sacrifice. If you'd like to respond to that invitation, do it right now while we stand and sing together, please. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His gracious hour? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you washing, Are you washing the blood in the blood in the soul cleansing blood?
you will bow with me, please. Father, we thank you so much for the blessings that you've given us, for the life that we have to lead, for the faith that we have, for the hope of eternal salvation. We thank you, God, so much for this. We thank you most of all for your Son, who came and died on the cross for our sins, who gave us an opportunity to be with you eternally. Help us to be mindful of that sacrifice. Help us to remember his body that was broken as we partake of this tonight. Lord, be with us and help us to do this in a pleasing manner, a way to give glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Don't forget that uh, next week um, will be the first Sunday of the month. And is that right? No, that's not all. Next, next Sunday is the 31st. Don't forget that two Sundays from now will be the first Sunday of the month. So we're looking forward to that. And don't forget the next Sunday will be the last Sunday of the month. That'd be bad if you forgot that. Um, thank Lord everyone could be here. And remember, men, that when the first Sunday of the month does roll around, that you're prepared to be in the men's business meeting and take part of that. Are there any other announcements that need to be made before we dismiss? BBS planning meeting. Meeting at Burning. Meeting at Burning as well. That's going on until Wednesday? I think it's through Wednesday night. Okay, through Wednesday night. And uh, next Sunday before evening services at 5 o'clock, we'll have a BBS planning meeting. So we can get things rolling on that as well. Um, anything else that needs to be announced? Um, do we have someone selected for closing prayer already? Don, will you say closing prayer, please? Well, Father, today we're so thankful for blessing us life. Thankful to Jesus Christ and brought the path to salvation so we might have a whole eternal life to you. Father, be with Father Kumar and all the preachers throughout the world are bringing 